Welcome to another episode of Investing Compass. Before we begin, a quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature. It does not take into consideration your personal situation, circumstances, or needs. So, Shani, we're recording this early, Mm. but we are releasing this. You just checked the schedule. We're releasing this on Christmas. Yeah. So anyone, Merry Christmas. Yeah, anyone who's listening, Merry Christmas. Now, where are you going to be on Christmas, Shawnee? I'll be in Port Macquarie, um, which is where my husband's family is. So, a beach Christmas. Okay, well, that's good. And yourself? I will be in Borneo with the orangutans. <laughs> and orangutans are obviously my natural family, thanks to your Australian cruelty against people with red hair. Okay, I'm not going to comment on that. But um, speaking of Australian, you've been trying Australian classics. Did you like that segue? Yeah, no, yeah. that was that was nice. You, <laughs> you did have no comment at all on that. But anyway, um, I have been. So and so, you tried your next one. Yeah, I try whatever you bring me. Mm-hmm. And you sent me a message on our internal chat app at work about this, and I didn't even know what it was. It's a violet crumble. I thought it was a band or something. I, I didn't think <laughs> I didn't know that this was the next in this line of Australian. Maybe things. we should start a band called Violet Crumble. Okay, I do you play any instruments? I played the trumpet up until like seventh grade. <laughs> so all right, you? Uh, no, I well I played piano for about a decade. Okay, you should be good then. I can't really remember much to be honest. So. Well, there we go. Well, there you go. So um, let's. we've been rating this. So you rated it when you were with me. You said it was a seven and a half, which is pretty good. And you really like Maltesers. And you give Maltesers a nine. Yeah, but I've actually, I, I've thought about it a little more. I think I was just caught up in the fact that I was hungry. You gave me chocolate at like 10 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I overrated it. Well, the thing was, it was 10 a.m. I gave you the chocolate and it was a very big violet crumble. It was. And I don't know what their normal size is, yeah, but it did seem it was very, very big. big. And you said that now was not the time to eat chocolate. And then I turned around and it was gone. So, Well, yes. You told me to try it. I tried it. <laughs> okay. Um, should we get on with the episode? Let's, let's do it. All right. So today we're going to do another sector spotlight, and this time it's financial services. Yeah. So this is a podcast where we talk about ourselves, at least our industry. Yeah, basically like we promise though we're just not going to sing our high praises and end the episode. No, I'm very self-deprecating. Yeah. So <laughs> if anything, this will be a you know very uh, very harsh look at the sector. Yeah. So let's speak to what characterizes a financial services company and let's take a look at the sector in general. And when we speak about financial services, it's a very broad term that covers so many different companies. There's banks and insurance companies, Fund and asset managers, investment banks, financing companies, superannuation, asset based lending. There's just a lot in there. And not only is there a lot in there, it makes up a lot of our portfolios too. If we look at the ASX 200, financial services makes up 30.5% of it, which is more than any other single sector. So it's bigger than the utilities, technology, communication services, real estate, consumer defensive, and consumer cyclical sectors combined. So it makes up 50% of the top 10 companies by market cap in Australia, and the big four banks make up over 20% of the top 200 companies just on their own. Let's take a look at an all-world index ETF, the iShares Miski ACWI ETF, with the ticker symbol ACWI, which trades on the NASDAQ. It represents a global stock market and holds large and mid-cap stocks listed in developed and emerging markets. And financial services sits at 16.27%. Then if we look at just large cap stocks, it drops to 13.83%. So there's a stark difference between the financial services landscape in Australia and the rest of the world. And so it's very likely that if you're an Aussie investor investing directly or investing through ETFs and funds, or both, you're likely to have exposure to the financial services sector. It's also likely that you've got an outsized position in the financial services sector. So let's take a deeper look at the constituents of the sector by diving one level deeper to the industries within the sector. We'll focus on three industries today, the banks, insurance, and asset managers. We've all heard of the term, the big four banks. We've done an episode on Westpac that explored the landscape in depth. So go and listen to that for an in-depth understanding of how banks operate and how they make profit. But we'll give a quick summary of some of the points here. 
Let's focus on those four large retail banks in Australia. They are all primarily domestically focused and get the vast majority of their revenue in Australia. And in Australia, there is a lot of concentration among the big four banks outside of market cap, which we talked about earlier. So Westpac, CBA, NAB, and ANZ collectively control 75% of business and consumer lending and around the same amount of deposits. And the scale of each of these banks clearly dwarfs their smaller rivals in an industry where scale and market share are an enormous competitive advantage. Not only are each of the big four at an advantage in the current environment, but is also de facto locked in. The Australian government's four pillars policy prevents any of the four major banks from taking each other over, and that negates the risk of peers merging to gain greater scale and competitive advantages. And when we are talking about competitive advantages, we are, of course, talking about moats. And unsurprisingly, given what I just outlined, we have wide moats on each of the big four banks. That competitive advantage stems from two sources, cost advantage and switching costs. All right. So let's speak a little bit about cost advantages. There are three places that cost advantages come into play with banks. The first is the cost to source funds that are lent out to people. Banks get loan funding from their depositors. Those are people like you and me who have bank accounts. And while they do have to pay interest on savings accounts, they pay almost nothing on transactions accounts. That makes it a cheaper source of capital than going out to the wholesale market and borrowing it. And when we look at the wholesale market, banks have an advantage over their smaller rivals also. They have strong credit ratings, which increases the sources of these wholesale funds and lowers the costs of borrowing them. And this once again has to do with the Australian banking system. Big four banks are considered by the market as too big to fail, meaning the market believes that the Australian government would step in if anything is going to happen to any of these banks. And since the Australian government has a strong credit rating, it contributes to the strong credit rating of the big four banks. The other area we see cost advantages from scale in banking is in looking at fixed costs. The cost of the money that is lent out is clearly important, but there are also other costs associated with banking or any business. There are branches and salaries and technology costs. When looking at a bank, it is important to review the cost to income ratios. Large banks can disperse fixed costs such as branches, technology spend, compliance costs, and support staff across a larger operating base, increasing operating efficiency. So the banks are just able to do that. The last cost advantage that large banks have with scale is the provision of bad debts. And remember that customers that don't pay back loans count as expenses for banks. A large loan book, diverse by customer, region, and sector, is an advantage. Larger banks also have the resources and data to support robust credit decisions, and this can lead to lower bad debts. And part of scale is also having lots of different products to offer customers. And this is the connection with our next moat source, switching costs. And switching costs is a source of moat or competitive advantage because they make customers stickier. So if you control a bigger market share and your customers are reluctant to leave, that is a good thing. Switching costs basically mean that it's a pain to switch so people don't do it. And once banks get their hooks into you with multiple products, it becomes harder and more time-consuming to switch. Once you've set up direct deposits with your paycheck, you've got BPay in there, you have all your friends' information set up so you can send them payments, it becomes much more of a hassle to switch banks, so most people just don't do it. The competitive advantages from cost advantages and switching costs have allowed the big banks to earn above-average returns on capital for decades, and we expect this to continue into the future. Smaller regional banks, large foreign banks, and neobanks have been trying to compete with the big four for quite some time, and they haven't really been able to dent their dominance. So, for example, there's ING Bank in Australia, and that has held a banking license in Australia since 1994 and has amassed a total loan book of almost $68 billion and $48 billion in deposits. ING has around 3.5% of the home lending market, so not very impressive. You know, I use ING as you one do. of my banks, so they've captured me. Do you think that's <laughs> impressive? Yeah. Or that's one of the things you want to throw back, right? <laughs> anyway, all right. So we have these big Goliath-like companies that are backed by the Aussie government. They're too big to fail. They have sticky customers, and they have multiple cost advantages. That's the situation in Australia. And it's really a case study in how government policy has allowed for institutions to fully take advantage of the natural competitive advantages that can develop in this industry. If you're looking to invest in banks in other markets where governments do not allow banks to get that big, you can think about the competitive dynamics that exist 
and how this impacts those banks. Morningstar Investor is built for investors by investors. It provides independent research and data on over 40,000 securities, tools to build and maintain an investment portfolio, and investor education resources to support you, regardless of where you are in your investing journey. Explore opportunities with our monthly global best ideas. Explore our ETF model portfolios. Plan better with two years of dividend forecasts for ASX listed stocks. And stay informed with independent thought leadership. We've built tools to help you construct, monitor, and maintain your portfolio, including our portfolio manager. Integrated with one of Australia's leading portfolio tracking tools, ShareSight, Morningstar has been empowering investor success for over 35 years. We're passionate about your outcomes and are here every step of the way as you achieve them. Take out a free four-week trial to access our resources. Find the details in the episode notes. Let's move on to insurance. We spoke a little bit about insurances when we examined Berkshire Hathaway, but basically they're the opposite in terms of the competitive landscape. The insurance industry isn't particularly conducive to the development of maintainable competitive advantages. Insurance is basically a commodity, and we've spoken about commodities before. Excess returns are difficult to achieve on a consistent basis. This is because buyers of insurance are not inclined to pay a premium for brands, and the products themselves are easy to replicate. There are very low switching costs, which means customers are just not that loyal. Because of this, the competition between insurance firms is very fierce, and they're known to undercut competitors. So it's just not an industry where you can gain and maintain market share very easily. It's also one of the few industries where the cost of goods sold is driven by the claims people make. So if you have $100 million in claims in a year, that would be your cost for the goods that you've sold, the insurance. And this cost of goods sold may not be known for a few years because of the lengthy claims process and delayed claiming. So there's more incentive for companies to sacrifice long-term profitability for new-term growth. When we look at the insurance industry in Australia, there are a few big players. QBE is the largest in market cap, followed by Suncorp, Allianz, and IAG. Australia is comparatively profitable when you look at how insurance companies operate in other areas like North America, but even still, it's not worth awarding a moat. When you analyse the Aussie market, you can see that much smaller competitors have shown an ability to match the underwriting expense ratio, which is the operating expenses divided by the net earned premium of market leaders. That means that the industry is susceptible to new entrants and constant competition, which of course is bad for business. An example of this is Hollard that demonstrates it was possible to grow market share in this industry with sharp pricing and a much leaner cost base in direct and private label clients. Basically, white labeling for Virgin Money, ING, Woolies, Qantas, and Medibank meant that they were able to access really large existing customer bases without needing to invest heavily in a new brand. So what we can draw from all this is that the Aussie market may be lucrative, but it is highly competitive. All right, we're going to move on to our last of three categories, asset managers and fundies. And for the majority of these firms, we're going to be talking about diversified financials. Eric Balchanis, a Bloomberg analyst, wrote a book called The Bogle Effect, where he spoke about the asset management industry. He said that in 2010, active equity mutual funds had about $3 trillion in assets in the US. Then, during the next 10 years, we saw $2.3 trillion in outflows, yet they ended up with more than $5.5 trillion, nearly double the assets and double the revenue. So today, every time the stock market goes up 1%, it raises the total assets of active funds by roughly $70 billion and their revenue by $410 million. And as we know, the market on average goes up more than it goes down. And regardless of this, even if the fund goes down, fees are still owed. It's a business model that rewards good and bad performance, but profits when markets overall rise, and there's a large determinant of success in this business. So let's go back to the diversified financial part. Many of these large asset managers are connected to other businesses, and we did see that in our share deep dive of Perpetual, where they had three arms of the business. Another great example is Macquarie Bank, an asset manager, an investment bank, a retail bank, leasing, a bit of everything. And so while some firms are taking advantage of this diversified model, there are other firms that are retreating from it. So many of the big four banks have sold off different parts of their business to focus just on retail and business banking. So they've gotten out of asset management, financial advice, and insurance. And this is because they foresaw lots of synergies as financial advice and insurance were sold to banking customers, and that just didn't develop. 
So that's not to say there aren't any pure plays. The largest asset manager pure play on the ASX is Janice Henderson. They cater to wholesale investors and they specialize in global equities. But the larger firms must also have the context of the other parts that surround it. And so that's what we need to explore to understand the merits of the business. And like we did in that share deep dive, we showed that each part of these diversified financials have different competitors. It's not always diversified financial A against diversified financial B. Each arm operates in their own ecosystem with their own competitors, their own challenges, their own opportunities. All right. So before we get into some of these opportunities that Shani talked about in the beginning, there's one other important thing to note about the financial services industry, and that is that it's really complex. And this should be an important consideration for investors. And Buffett talks about investing with his within his circle of competence. As investors, we need to be students of business. And if you're going to be, invest in a particular company, you should understand the industry and the drivers that impact that company. And yeah, this complexity comes from a lot of different places. You have the influence of interest rates, the overall economy, and if people are borrowing money and paying off loans. You, of course, have stock market returns, the weather when it comes to insurance. The balance sheet and the financial statements of these firms and the loan books are quite opaque, and they're very different than a lot of other firms. You also have really well-paid employees who repeatedly throughout history take very large risks with the firm's money, which leads to a surprising amount of these firms blowing up. And it's hard to avoid investing in financials if you're an investor because they make up such a large part of the market, but it's just something to be wary of. Yeah, exactly. And personally, I don't invest in financial services firms as individual companies with the exception of one Canadian bank that I've owned for a while. And the reason for this is just the fact that I got burned in the GFC, where I did not appreciate all the risks of what I was investing in. And incidentally, it was pretty obvious that the bank executives and the regulators also didn't understand the risk of what was happening. And when the, while this was a unique situation, I realized I would never really be able to grasp the full spectrum of risks involved in these companies. But of course, that is just me. I think it's getting to the point where it's hard to tell what you would invest in, Mark. Well, I'm very old, so I've been burned <laughs> by a lot of things at this point, Shani. So, what, uh, so there's not much left. But anyway, obviously, it's just something to keep in mind. Are these companies that you can fully understand and fully understand all the different drivers that make them profitable or not profitable. But let's shift gears here. We've taken a look at the industries. So let's go a level lower and look at some of the individual companies within financial services. And we'd like to focus on where our analysts see opportunities and what we think is overvalued. So let's start with opportunities. Yeah, well, that's easy because we actually don't think there are many standout opportunities in financial services at the moment. The industry as a whole has some undervalued companies but no wide or narrow moat stocks are in our five-star territory. We do see one no moat rated company trading at a meaningful discount. And that's a buy now, pay later company that has fallen out of favor massively. We see Zip trading at a meaningful enough discount to fall into five-star territory as at the 15th of November. Yeah, but you're probably not going to get a lot of praise from the two of us for <laughs> Zip and a lot of interest in investing in so it. So let's just stop there on that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so what we know everyone wants to know about, Shani, right, is the banks. All these love banks. Yeah, exactly, Shani. So I think once we started talking about banks and moved on to boring insurance, probably most people stopped listening, but maybe a couple people are still on here. All right. So maybe we should give an overview of where we see the banks. Okay. So in that Westpac deep dive that we referenced, Westpac remains our top pick, followed by ANZ. They're both trading at material discounts to our $29 fair value for Westpac and $31 fair value for ANZ. If we turn over and look at ComBank and NAB, we see ComBank is trading at a premium, NAB is fairly valued. So we have a fair value estimate of $87 on ComBank and $29 on NAB. In the case of Westpac and ANZ, we think the market is over-penalizing both banks for lost home loan market share due to operational issues and is too skeptical that the banks can simultaneously fix issues and lower costs. If we look outside of the major banks, we do see some opportunities as well. Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, which is our pick of the no-moat rated non-major banks, trading at a material discount to our $10.20 fair value estimate. We think that there's a lot of opportunity for Bendigo Adelaide Bank to improve margins. They get half of their customer deposits from community bank branches, which are very sticky and relatively low cost to fund. 
So there you have it. The financial services industry, something that is very complicated, involves a lot of very different industries, and is something that hugely influences the Australian market. So sure, something that everyone is interested in. We hope you've enjoyed the podcast today. We would, hope you're having a great Christmas. We hope you're having a great Christmas. <laughs> yes. How many people do you think are actually going to listen to this on Probably Christmas? Probably not many. Yeah. Well, anyway, we hope you had a great Christmas then. <laughs> Hopefully, we both did, and the orangutans did not capture me and take me off to live with them in the jungles of Borneo. But we will be back with new episodes if that doesn't happen. Shawnee's laughing at me a lot. <laughs> but we would love a Christmas gift of a rating or a comment in our podcast apps. And of course, you can email me with my email address in the show notes. Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.